to talk with everybody. I think this might be the sixth year or more, I don't know, uh, in a row that I've uh, actually been able to present for CompTIA. It's been really exciting to do that. Uh, uh, so we got people from North Carolina. Uh, let's see from, yeah, Jamaica is beautiful. Uh, how you doing, Bermuda? Good to see you, Ben. Tucson, Arizona. So look at that, two radically different climates. Three here with Washington, right? Hey, Michigan, how you doing? Well, let's go ahead and get started. First of all, can you see my slides? You should be seeing uh, the title, Underrated and Overrated Cybersecurity Skills, a Global Report. Uh, hopefully you can see that. Uh, I'm going to uh, stop and reshare here real quick because for some reason I can't seem to see my particular PowerPoint slides the way I want to see them. So let me see if I can get that situated right. So keep telling me, folks, where you're joining in from here. And I don't know why that is doing that. It's really annoying. So let me see here one more time. I've got things shared on the wrong darn screen. I don't know why that is. One of these days I'll learn how to make a PowerPoint. Uh, I'll learn how to. Uh, share PowerPoint slides, right, folks? I may not be able to get this to go the way I want. Let's see here. Let's see. Yeah, that'll do. All right, that'll do. All right, now I will share my screen and see what we can do. All right. One more time. Well, forgive the uh, technical difficulties, folks. I'll see if I can bring up the, uh, the uh, chat here so I can actually see what you guys are all saying. And we'll go from there. I don't know why that's appearing. Kind of annoying. All right. We will go over here. Good. All right. And let's see. How y'all doing? So let's see. More people. Malaysia. Missoula. I like that. Kuala Lumpur. We are from all over. Uh, you know, I was not in Kuala Lumpur, uh, Azar, but I was in Bangkok recently. And I've been lucky enough, folks, uh, in, in my travels to go ahead uh uh, to go ahead and, uh, you know, boy, I've been presenting at Jamaica, and then let's see, a couple of weeks ago, I was in uh, India, Singapore, and Thailand. Uh, and before that, I was in Europe. So greetings, folks. Uh, we're going to talk about underrated and overrated cybersecurity skills. And, and this is a global report. I work for the uh, research division for CompTIA. That's my job. I, it's a lot of fun uh, talking uh, research. And we are a global education company. Uh, we have members, and we at CompTIA get into education because our members told us to. Uh, uh, there's There are just too many, uh, there's too much technology, not enough people, and we're looking to solve that problem. Today, folks, it's all about cybersecurity, cybersecurity month, right? Uh, but I, I think it's cybersecurity month is every month, frankly. But what does cybersecurity really mean? Uh, if I have to forgive the Princess Bride uh, kind of approach that I'm going to take because it's a fun movie. And I think that word security, uh, you know, what is it? You keep on using that word. I don't think that word means what you think it means. Uh, and we'll even talk about that whole cyber security versus security thing and all that. Uh, we're going to talk about the state of security today. And specifically, we're going to talk about overrated and underrated skills. And I'm probably going to say a few outrageous things. Uh, because that's what I like to do now, uh, because I, I really want to focus on the true meaning of what security is. How you doing, Jeff uh, from California and Karen from hello? And Nikki, what do you get when you combine a rhetorical question with a joke? That's a, that's a good question. The meaning of cybersecurity. OK, uh, once again, uh, you know, the, 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 the Princess Bride theme. And you also have to forgive my uh, slightly red nose. Don't worry, I, I don't drink anything stronger than Diet uh, Coke or maybe Diet Dr. Pepper. Um, I've got some sort of allergy going on. I don't know what it is. But I think the meaning of cybersecurity does mean different things to different contingencies, different groups. When I say contingencies, I'm talking about, for example, groups like executives. When they think of cybersecurity, they have a tendency to think of security as a cost or something that slows things down, right? Techies think of security a different way. So do non-techies, right? Uh, you know, the typical end user. What do they think in terms of security? Well, purely pretty much in terms of their personal devices. Okay, fair enough. You know, the mobile phones this is my mobile phone here. Um, it does mean different things. To executive, cybersecurity can mean a cost center. It can mean slowing things down. They tend to think of, the, of it, though, in terms of risk. When it comes to techies, uh, we tend to think of, of security as something that is a technical solution when, in fact, it's a business solution. So you end up with techies and non-techies kind of talking 
past each uh, techies and executives, excuse me, talking past each other a bit. But there are non-techies as well. And especially when people want to get into security, they'll say, well, I want to get into cybersecurity. And it's interesting to see people kind of as they get started, because they'll say things like, well, I want to become a pen tester. Because that's what they hear about, right? Yeah, I want to hack into systems and prove that they can be hacked into and blah, blah, blah. But then it's like, is that really what security is? Because there are many nuances and facets of security. One of the first things I want you to understand is the many different types of job roles that exist in cybersecurity. I'm going to talk about a lot of those today. Not all of them, there's not enough time. But it's really important to think about it in terms of, because it's funny, people say, well, I want to be a pen tester. A lot of people will also look at security in terms of forensics. Now, it's different than pen testing. Forensics is different than security analytics, right, which is different than GRC. So I've already listed several job roles here. And I think it's really important to think about that. Now, what, what I want you to do is to type into your uh, into the meeting chat window. Uh, when somebody says cybersecurity, what does it mean to you? So what does cybersecurity mean to you? Because it's interesting. Uh, one of the patterns that I see as people talk about cybersecurity or security, they'll say, well, I want to be a pen tester. And then they'll start listing off job uh, skills, actual skills that have really nothing to do with pen testing. You know, they'll say, well, I want to analyze uh, uh, hacks or I want to do threat identification. Well, that's not really pen testing, is it, right? So it's, I think there's some confusion out there and I just want to uh, further confuse you. No, I want to see if we can talk about some of those things because it really is the case of, you keep on using that word, I don't think it means what you think it means. I'll go, go on one of my little pet uh, little rants here real quick. I'm not a fan of the term cybersecurity. And by the way, I don't see people typing in uh, open up the chat window. You can go and take a look at it and um, click on the chat window. Uh, if you look at the little applet or whatever you want to call it. There we go. Nikki, thank you. Protection. Yeah, I like that. That's a good meaning. Hacks, right? Yep, good. John, you can think of it in terms of making hacks or not making hacks. But while you guys are typing things in, thank you, Nikki and John and everybody else, follow suit. Uh, yeah, vulnerable. It's really important. The word cybersecurity, that, that tends to be a, a word that the government, uh, when I say the government, many governments, like the five eyes, the US, Canada, UK, New Zealand, Australia, the five eyes, they use that word cyber. Uh, you can always tell a government person because they'll just talk about, it. well, I, I, I work in cyber. Uh, it just drives me nuts. I'm sorry. I've always, I, I talk about it in terms of security. I have for 20, 25 years. And that just makes more sense to me than cyber. Somehow cyber is a very 1950s kind of, you know, uh, invasion of the body snatchers type of, you know, era thing. Although I do love the movie Invasion of the Body Snatchers. Jeff, keeping private information private. Yeah, see, so we're talking in terms of, I like that, Bailey, pain. Why? Because you're studying uh, uh, security or because it's a pain? It is, Kevin, a constant battle. There's a lot of burnout that happens when it comes to cybersecurity. Yes, keeping assets safe. Gatekeepers. Yes, uh, Karen. And I've seen that term gatekeeper used as a positive and also as a negative, right? Um, security is often, uh, I've seen it used by bureaucrats, for example, Bill, uh, as a way to go, well, uh, I, I think there are cyber implications here, which is their way of saying, I don't like this idea for whatever reason. And they'll use it as a, as kind of a block or a gatekeeper thing. Yes, it can be a pain for developers, Bailey. And we're going to talk about technical debt and how I like to use that term to talk about some of the security issues that come in. So first of all, cybersecurity, I, I guess they come up with that just because it means you, a lot of times security means physical security, you know, like camera monitoring and a person with a nightstick and walking the beat or whatever. I get it. Uh, but nevertheless, there are many job roles in security. Now take a look at this graphic. Patrick Lane, uh, who works at Fercantia, yeah, a uh, great guy. He he put this together as I think a nice little graphic here. The graphic here is meant to show how back uh, for, there are still companies that still follow the kind of one team approach, but that one team approach was very common all the way through 2010 and sometimes is even now where the infrastructure and the security people worked together in the same department. And what I mean by infrastructure, I'm talking about the people that provide the IT service, you know, the, the web servers, the email, the database, the, the CRM, the technology that keeps the company going. And then it was all mixed together with security. So it, there really was no separation of duties, or they'll call it segregation of duties. In 2015, you had a few hacks that happened, some big ones, and people kind of realized, oh, okay, maybe 
the infrastructure team that provides the service should report separately through the organization than the people who provide cybersecurity. Because what tends to happen, right, unless you have really good communication and really smart folks, it tends to occur that the if you put the infrastructure people in terms of security, it's kind of like, uh, well, yeah, I put it up there, and of course it's secure. I did it, right? And that's a conflict of interest, to be honest, right? What you need is a separate entity, somebody who doesn't report through the same through the uh, through the organization in the same way. Come along, and go, hey, I'm going to take a look at the security of what you're doing because it's really important for us to figure that out. But if you don't do that, you just have a tendency to go, well, yeah, I made it and security is done and it's no big deal when in fact it isn't done and it is a big deal. So in 2021 or so, you have a situation, 2020 here, according to this graphic, you have a situation where so many hacks kept happening, all right? And, and they're like, well, we already have the infrastructure people offering what they should do, right? Making it work. Then you have cybersecurity operations people saying, hey, yeah, we're reviewing it, we're auditing it. But there's a management component that it has brought out. So there's at least three different hats there. Now, as you embark on your cybersecurity career, and I like to look at it in terms of pathways, right? Think about it in terms of what you want to do. Now, do you like the technical side, the geeky stuff where you, you want to get into security and learn, uh, you know, uh, I'll use a cliche here, Kali Linux and Metasploit for pen testing, or I want to use Security Onion, you'll see what I'm talking about here, or analytics tools to listen in on what the hackers are doing. Or do you want to take a less technical, but still very vital, you know, I want to understand what it means to be a cyber manager. I know a policeman, for example, an ex-policeman in the UK. Uh, he took an uh, A plus, network plus, security plus, became uh, a security worker, but on the compliance side of things. Because he said, you know, my previous history as a Bobby was I would hear people's cockamamie stories, silly stories, and I would get to the bottom of those stories. He said that that life skill, you know, I translated very well into cybersecurity because he would say that he, I, I, I don't think he's right, but he would say, I'm not a particularly technical person, but I'm very good at reading documentation interviewing people, and then making sure that they're compliant to a rule, okay? So that's a very different skill than pen testing. It's a very different skill than security analytics. My point is there are a lot of different jobs out there. And, and even though if you don't live in the United States uh, or Australia, you can click on this link. And by the way, I've got some links here for you, a link here for you, if you want to download the slides. Um, there's the link right there. And you'll also get a QR code at the end of this presentation. Uh, when I say right there, it's in the meeting chat. You'll get a, uh, you'll see a QR code where you can download these slides. But if you were to go to cyberseek.org or Cyber Explorer, um, Cyber meaning for Australia, you would, ch you would be able to see various job roles. And yes, that is, those two links are centered on the US and Australia. But my point is those job roles are universal. And you can see so many that are available. And here's some of them, right? There's a security analyst. Security analyst listens for attacks, right? Uh, I love the idea of a security analyst because that's the person who says, look, I'm, gonna, I, I'm looking at a visualization of attacks. I work in a security operations center or a SOC and I listen for it. Well, that's different than somebody who's a cloud security administrator uh, working in an organization where they have a lot of assets in AWS or Azure or Alibaba Cloud or wherever it is. And I administer and I make sure that there are security controls for the cloud resources. See, that's different than a security analyst. Are they related? Well, yeah, sure. Right. In the same way you're related to members of your family, your sisters, your brothers, your cousins, your dad, whatever. But that doesn't mean they're the same thing. You're not the same thing. There are people who do vulnerability uh, and pen testing, the APT, right? That's different than a cloud security admin. That's different than a security analyst. Threat hunters kind of combine the VAPT and security analysts. You kind of have a red and blue thing kind of mixed together, which makes purple team, right? That's threat hunting. But there are security consultants that really do things quite differently than, um, than uh, uh, they basically come on in and solve problems. Hopefully they don't cause them, they solve problems. But there are compliance specialists like the Bobby I was telling you about, the former Bobby. There are risk managers, which is very closely related to a compliance specialist. There are people who work in SOC uh, security operations centers who aren't full-blown security analysts, but are people who look for issues, they look for alerts, and then they 
put those alerts, uh, how should I put it? They do triage on those alerts and do an initial evaluation and send them on up the scale. Their security engineers, their job is to create security controls for an organization. Those controls could involve focusing on equipment to get zero trust going or uh, and, and uh, services. It, the services uh, security engineer could put together a firewall, sure, uh, but, um, you know, firewalls are kind of table stakes. There's more to security than firewalls. But a security engineer basically focuses on various types of security controls to, to uh, secure an organization. Some of those controls could be uh, technical. Some of those things could be compensatory, meaning, uh, or think of ways like security insurance. Now, that's, that's what, uh, so security engineers have a technical and non-technical component. So a lot of different job roles out there. Now, Okay, enough of, the, uh, of that discussion. Let's talk about the state of cybersecurity today or security today, right? Uh, and I, I would argue uh, that it's pretty much of a mess, right? Uh, it really is. Um, there are too many root causes for the security problems that we're having, but there are kind of the big five out there, okay? The advanced persistent threat, ransomware, supply chain attacks, and DDoS attacks. These are the problems. Now, don't get too focused on the problems because we it's more important to understand what the cause, the root cause of these kinds of issues is. And it's not just, well, there are bad guys out there or bad actors out there. It's more than that because there are too many organizations skip steps and they don't properly educate their folks and they, and they cause some of these problems for themselves. And those things manifest themselves in APTs, ransomware supply chain attacks. An advanced persistent threat means that if somebody is very quiet and they are operating below a threshold, they don't want to announce their presence. They lurk in your systems. And there's all these numbers you'll hear. Uh, you know, the average hacker stays in a company 186 days or 110 days or however many uh, unacceptable days it is. Um, uh, oh, there's only four. Did I say five? Well, I should have said four. Ah, somebody's actually listening to what I said, Adrian. Sorry about that. Sorry, everybody. I should say uh, four things. Jeez Louise. I'm losing my mind. Uh, so I should say the big four there. I don't know why I put five. Um, I did put a fifth down there at one point and I changed my mind. I should have uh, out of uh, my slides better. Sorry about that, folks. So an APT means that uh, the threat actor is lurking around in your systems for a long time. Ransomware is very different. It's obvious, right? It makes his presence known. It locks your system and then threatens to do certain things. Either, look, I'm not gonna give your system back to you, right? Unless you pay me money or Bitcoin or whatever. We, we know that. Uh, ransomware does interesting, can do interesting things though. It can also do something called doxing. Uh, doxing meaning this, um, I've taken over your systems and company or organization, I'm gonna reveal sensitive information unless you pay me money. See, that's, that's slightly different than typical ransomware. Uh, if a company is GDPR compliant or CCPA compliant in California or in various countries, um, if they have a situation where data gets released, well, that's that costs money. Uh, in GDPR, it co could cost an organization hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars if information gets out, privacy, private information. So doxing is, is an, another clever way that things happen. Yeah, it's basically blackmail, Nikki, right? That's ransomware can take the form of blackmail. Um, supply chain attacks are always interesting. They could take the form eventually of ransomware or the form of DDoS or uh, APT attacks. But it's the idea that as you get software that comes to you, that, that you trust, you know, that it comes from a, a big time trusted company, right? That it gets that it still has some sort of bad code in it or, or bad problem in it, whether it be hardware or software or a service. Uh, you could argue that people who uh, get disgruntled in the workforce, that could be kind of a supply chain attack because it's, it's the supply chain of workers that come to you that um, could be introducing problems for your company, right? They, they might be bad actors. Um, software that comes to you, we saw this with many different... Uh, attacks over the years, but the solar winds attack. If you Google that, you'll see uh, that's an example of a supply chain attack. Uh, we, but we've seen 
situations where governments have gotten used all sorts of hardware and that hardware showed up with firmware in it that basically some sort of nation state had gotten a hold of and had poisoned that or or hacked that uh, firmware. And all of that, those systems that the government used were pre-hacked. People worry about that with cloud providers and cloud providers are very careful to identify the origin of the supply of the chips and things that come to them. But you know, things can always go wrong. Distributed denial of service attacks is basically where bad actors use elements of the internet to create uh, bad traffic. And that bad traffic can be floods of massive amounts of traffic, or it could be malformed small uh, forms of packets, uh, uh, small amounts of malformed packets that can do denial of service attack. They're not always volumetric. So those are the big four. Sorry about that. I guess I don't know how to add. We've got a lot of emerging tech folks. Uh, that organizations, whether they're governments or whether they're small businesses or huge businesses, they feel that using IoT software as a service, the cloud, right, platform as a service, that using IoT, robotics and artificial intelligence and data, those are the things that are going to keep us alive as organizations, okay? That those are the things that are the growth drivers through at least 2023. Well, if those are the elements that are going to keep us growing, then hackers are going to go after those elements. Do you know what I'm trying to say? So IoT will continue to be a security issue. It has been for years. Why? Well, generally IoT devices, your smartwatch, right, or whatever, um, they tend to be made very quickly and they tend to be made as cheaply as possible, right? Because they're a commodity. Well, so you skip steps. Right. If you're uh, and that happens. Right? And we've seen this, the flood, the deluge of early webcams and IoT devices that had no password associated that, that yet they were network enabled. Right. I mean, they're perfect monoculture uh, candidates for being taken over by botnets, et cetera. Webcams. Right. Um, all sorts of devices that have no ability for changing a password no, or, or updating firmware. Can't do that. Uh, all these things. And they basically become toxic assets for bad guys, okay, to exploit. Now, we live in a cloud-first hybrid world, okay, meaning we're probably, you know, more and more going to the cloud to source our solutions. But we will always still use data centers. I think it's really important to understand. I, I see so many people going, well, it's all about the cloud now. Well, that's like saying it's, you know, cyber this or, or security is only one uh, you know, one thing like pen testing or only one thing like forensics. It's, it's, we're not always going to be just using the cloud. There are very good reasons why we will still use data centers and even install things, both in terms of speed, sometimes cost, sometimes flexibility. Um, more and more, of course, we're going to use the cloud more. But right now, and for many, many years, data centers will still contain the vast majority of computing technology. So yes, we've seen things like email, web uh, technologies, web, uh, the web presence for a company, uh, business productivity suites and collaboration suites, you know, things like Zoom, obviously go to the cloud, right? Obviously. Uh, we do see more virtual desktops and things, but there's still a reason why we, we uh, keep things, how should I put it, out of the cloud, not just in terms of security, but just in terms of things like flexibility, cost, network latency, and things like that. We love our net. We love our services. For example, our data lakes. Uh, that's a lake I took a picture of in England here, not, uh, not too long ago. Um, and then the, here's an example of a data lake service. That's an example of how you can take all the data from an IoT device, crunch all of that data, and turn it into actionable information. But the things that are in the cloud or our data centers, are they, you know, nice, beautiful, uh, tranquil lakes like this? Or are they assets that are basically like Mount St. Helens here that I, I hiked uh, not too long ago? Um, are these things that, that could blow up on us? So where do we start when it comes to security becomes the question, right? Well, think about it this way. Data and information really is the primary target today. People will say, well, James, they go after applications. Hackers do. They do. They also go after our databases, but they're they're basically trying to get information at us. And I think that's really important to understand that whether they're taking a blackmail kind of approach or what have you, um, that's the important thing. Well, let's talk about some overrated skills, okay? Some overrated ideas, right? I'm not saying these are unimportant, but they are overrated. For example, the concept of defense in depth. Now, in my opinion, there's a good reason why you do defense in depth. But it's different than the typical, uh, well, 
you have to have multiple firewalls or multiple antivirus or multiple security analytics applications because if one fails you that's not the reason why you do defense in depth you'll see why it has to do with monitoring but as a as a as a skill you know defense in depth what you know that just means that there are a lot of companies out there love to buy software and it folks love i love to sell software i should say i uh, a lot of companies that love to sell software it folks love to buy software right um, that's not what de defense in depth really means. So once again, it's kind of one of those situations like in the Princess Bride, you keep up on using that phrase, defense in depth. I don't think it means what you think it means. And I'll explain what, what it really means. The good to go model, which is basically, well, they logged in. So they logged in in the morning, so they must be secure all day. That's what I mean by good to go. Oh, you logged in once or you've authenticated once or you, you've passed some sort of scan at first. Done, fine. Well, you're not good to go. Hackers love to manipulate the assumption that, yeah, that process that's on your mobile phone uh, is always good to go when they hack it. Then, you know, if they hack that process, they can take over your phone, move laterally and move on and take over the entire network, right? So nothing is ever good to go, right? That's a, that's, that's a perspective and skill that uh, it doesn't work. So the idea of just, you know, I logged into the Windows domain, I must be okay. Mm -hmm. Not at all. Direction-based perspectives is another skill that's overrated. In other words, thinking in terms of inside and outside, or uh, that's what I mean by direction, or uh, data center people, cloud people will talk about northbound data and southbound data. North and south meaning egress, and uh, meaning data coming in north, data coming out south. Or if data is moving between one asset inside a cloud or in a data, in a data center, that's called east-west traffic. That might be fine, I suppose, when you're thinking about how to manage traffic in terms of volume, in terms of sourcing, uh, and in terms of uh, fine tuning or provisioning systems, but it doesn't work real well with security. And the answer is risk exists no matter where you are in regards to the firewall. It's taken IT departments years to realize this in a, on a practical level. So if you're thinking in terms of uh, direction or where traffic is coming from and, and security, you're, in, you're, you're on uh, shaky ground. Perimeter-based thinking, very related to that. The idea that the firewall will save us. Well, we all know there are at least as many hackers on the inside as the outside. Maybe different perspectives might be different. How should I put it? Different uh, motivations, but nevertheless, there are issues. Uh, pen testing by itself is definitely an overrated skill. Um, combined with other things, makes perfect sense. I'll explain that. The idea of the security worker as the wizard or guru or cowboy who's going to save the day or whatever like that. Trust me, I love Westerns, but I don't like the, the old West mentality when it comes to security. Let's talk about some underrated skills. First of all, the idea instead of the wizard or the guru, and trust me, I love watching a great Clint Eastwood movie, why not? But I would rather think in terms of of a friend of mine who works as um, in, a, in a police force, not as a forensic specialist, right? But uh, she works as basically the leader of a security operations center. And as the leader of the security operations center, she encourages her people to say, hey, uh, to basically think in terms of, look, you need to think of yourself as the cyber detective or the security detective is what I would say. The idea of a team leader. Or a guide, you know, team leader like a team leader in a in, a, in soccer and football, uh, or in baseball or whatever. That team leader detective idea, or the guide. Uh, let's see, that's my kid Jacob. I was guiding him up Mount Snowden here a few years ago in England. Um, the idea of security as the guide. These are perspectives that are underrated and are very important. Remember, I was telling you about defense in depth. Well, the reason why you have defense in depth isn't so much to make it so that if one system fails, one backups, that's, that's, that's not really the point of it. Take a look at this picture that I took. This is the Tower of London. Do you notice all the battlements there? Notice all the walls. There's one, two, at least two walls there, right? And, and then notice there's that other building, which constitutes kind of another wall. Do you see all the layers there? Well, clearly medieval people or pre-medieval people here clearly believed actually they would be post-medieval. Uh, around 1066, 10, 1100 is when that Tower of London first started to be built. They actually were onto something. 
And I'm not saying that that defense in depth is as bad and medieval or, or or old or whatever. What I'm saying is, is we have to know why we are doing this. And that principle that they had here was not so much to, well, if one thing fails, then we can go back to the inside and all that, uh, you know, further back in the, the, the layers of the onion. The real reason why they did secu- uh, defense in depth is to enable better monitoring. Notice all of the ways in which you are being monitored here. See all the windows there in that in that high tower there, right? But do you notice all the little other check mark, little little cutouts in the wall? Yes, those are there so that people could fire arrows or whatever. But really, it's there for enhanced monitoring, right? Notice that there's a moat here, and then people are able to either shoot their arrows out, but to view. It's all about monitoring and monitoring. They they, they monitor each other, etc. It's that's the real meaning of defense in depth. So the old idea of defense in depth, you know, as backup or whatever, nah, that's overrated. But defense in depth in terms of actually making it possible to kind of layer, properly layer your monitoring is very important. And this picture of onions, I'm using it uh, in a very serious way because there is a tool out there that's a security analytics tool called Security Onion. Security Onion meaning layer after layer after layer of visibility okay, of, of monitoring tools. That is something that I think is very interesting and underrated, the idea of security analytics and monitoring. Because now we're talking about the idea of not just using Kali Linux to do pen testing. That's fine. Kali Linux is a, is a version of Linux that has a whole bunch of tools installed on it that allows pen testers to do things. Um, most pen testers that I know, actually, I don't see them using a lot of Kali. I see them using a lot of custom tools that they make themselves. But I'll use Kali Linux as the poster child for pen testing, right? Uh, so if Kali Linux is to pen testing, well, Security Onion is another version of Linux that has a bunch of security monitoring tools on it. And the idea is to take these ugly log files. I think that's, let me see that, put my glasses here real quick. That I think is a uh, squid proxy server uh, log file. Kind of ugly, right? And that's fine. It's good, to, uh, very important to understand how to read log files. But imagine if you could plug those ugly log files into something here uh, using various tools. Security Onion has uh, Zeek and Suricata. These are intrusion detection tools. and But they don't just generate logs that you can view, which you can do if you want. But imagine them being put into a search capability, right? In this case, Elasticsearch. Elastic uh, is a company. Uh, different background this time. All right. Well, I'm sorry about that. Uh, seemed to have had some sort of power outage. So uh, I'll have to figure out what the heck that was all about. So I apologize for that. I was talking about something called Security Onion when everything kind of went kablooey. So uh, Security Onion basically allows you to use various different types of tools to turn those ugly log files into more actionable information. And this is an underrated skill. So using Elasticsearch and a fancy a little, kind of like a web server called Kibana, you can basically take all of those log files and organize them. So notice you can move from your kind of uh, uh, log files into, well, look, I can drill down into 15,533 events. And there's a few of those events. Well, what you can do is you can start to organize those events into visualized stories. And this is very important. You can use bar charts, you can use pie charts. But in this case, what I'm doing is I'm drilling down into thousands of packets to look for trends, okay? That's effectively what I'm doing because what I did here is I identified a denial of service attack, a distributed denial of service attack. And I was able to go in and I was able to identify the bad actor, which happened to be the router that I had. Um, and it was uh, vulnerable to a denial of service attack. So you can see the 192.168.56.1. Notice how there's a big spike there in that little graphic. I was able to drill down in here. So an underrated skill, one that's very important to to know and understand, is the idea of being able to organize data. Uh, We've all played with Legos, or we have kids that play with Legos, right? Well, Think of data in terms of, or security data in terms of Legos. So if Legos are strewn around on the floor, well, that's data. But if you start to sort it and arrange it and turn it into something, you know, you can take your your Legos and turn it into um, a house 
or you can make it look like a car or a spaceship or whatever you want to turn it into. Now it has more value. Now it's explained with a story. We do the same thing as security workers. So an underrated approach, folks, is taking the pen testers, the red and blue teams, and combining them to create actionable information. The red team generates noise. The blue team analyzes it and comes up with better security controls. An underrated skill along the lines of pen testing is open source intelligence. Learn what it means to use active and passive reconnaissance. You could use dnsdumpster.com, for example, or the osintframework.com to understand what it means to use freely available information as a pen tester. That's an underrated skill. You can use Shodan, for example. These are all ways that you can use open source intelligence information. Heck, you can even start with a Whois search. But then you can start conducting all sorts of different uh, analytics. For example, there's a tool out there called Maltigo that allows you to basically plug in information. In this case, I plugged in information about myself, my Twitter account, and I was able to kind of drill right down in there. And it was a little spooky where somebody could actually go, hmm, where is James or where is somebody going? That's, that's OSINT. You're learning intelligence to profile people. The reason why we do all these things isn't to just geek out, okay? We create data sets and security workers do data set analytics. It's very important to understand because we help make adjustments to improve trust, okay? An overrated skill, folks, or a perspective is the idea of the defender's dilemma. The defender's dilemma is that old, if one person in your organization clicks on a bad link, then the quarterback is toast or, you know, we're, we're hacked, right? That's not very empowering. It's not very accurate either. I feel an underrated perspective and a much more important perspective is somebody a few years ago from Microsoft said, we need to focus on the attacker's dilemma. Okay, think about that. We all know that hackers do OSINT. They do uh, research, okay? They do reconnaissance, that they use tools to hack into a vulnerability, right? Well, if a hacker makes a mistake, makes too much noise, that means that person has made a mistake and you can listen for that. So focusing on the attacker's dilemma is far more empowering and productive. So as an attacker, for example, does the initial compromise or escalates privileges or does internal reconnaissance, all these things, think about, right? How can that hacker make a mistake and how can we discover and automate responses. We've talked about SOAR, security orchestration and response for so long. It's really neat when organizations make it happen. I was in Thailand recently and I loved seeing how the security operations center workers were automating responses. They were very clever about doing it. Underrated perspective is the idea of application security. I was talking to a gentleman named Steven in Belgium and he said for his company, they've moved to the cloud for the most part, Excuse me, forgive me. Uh, but he said, it's all about the applications. Well, if it's all about the applications to make money, then that means hackers are gonna be making money hacking into those applications. So it's important for you to learn how applications talk. And that starts with understanding the TCP handshake. Do you understand, for example, moving on from that TCP handshake, how HTTP works, okay? If you don't, learn, because that's how most applications uh, from Zoom, uh, I believe Zoom, uh, to most of your mobile applications, and certainly your web applications, that's how they think and talk. So you need to understand how that works. Do you know how TLS works? SSL, right? It's not really SSL. We haven't used SSL for years. But TLS works. And it's a nine-step negotiation, well, eight-step negotiation moving into finish. Understanding that negotiation is important because Bad actors will try to talk down TLS to levels that can be easily hacked. You have to understand how the client and the server works, whether it be a, a, a mobile phone, IoT device, or an operational technology device. Because before you can use a cool tool like Burp Suite, you're looking at a, a, a screenshot from Burp Suite, you have to understand the nature of the conversation you're listening into. I remember saw, seeing a person stampeded right into using uh, the beef browser and burp suite, but then didn't realize what he was looking at because he was listening in on a conversation, but he didn't know the language. <laughs> I mean, so you can hack into somebody talking, excuse me, all day long, but if you don't know what they're saying, <laughs> it doesn't do much good. 
so you need to understand application programming interfaces, okay, uh, and how they work. An API is basically like a menu in a restaurant or a server in a restaurant. You would never go in to talk to the cook directly in most restaurants or any restaurant, right? You talk to the server. And then the server, they turn around and say, hey, James wants X, Y, and Z. That's what an API does. But APIs can also be misconfigured. They can be taken over by botnets. There's a lot of times we have data exposure happening due to bad encryption and bad authentication. An underrated skill is understanding as one technology connects with another, a web server to a SQL server, or an API client to an API endpoint, or a human being connecting to email. There's always this thing called an interstice that's happening. And it's your job to identify the root causes of why that interstice went wrong. What's the root cause of the end user being hacked? Well, we probably didn't educate them, okay? So what are those root causes and how can we fix them? Another underrated skill, folks, is the concept of zero trust, okay? It's being implemented even as we speak, uh, but it's a tough one to understand because zero trust isn't like firewalls where you can just say, well, hey, here's the firewall, right? You can actually physically bring in a firewall. Zero trust, you're looking at it about eight, and here's the first six different approaches and technologies that all have to work and play well together in order for zero trust to happen, okay? So zero trust replaces some of these overrated things I was talking about earlier, the good to go model, the defense in depth model, the, the proper, improper understanding of it. And the idea that, well, security is something that lags innovation. Uh, zero trust is really cool because it means that you're doing constant monitoring and you don't rely on VPNs as much anymore. You're, you're focusing on encrypting and, and monitoring the endpoint. And that endpoint includes your mobile phone, your workstation, but also routers, switches, firewalls, all sorts of devices. So there's about six different elements here that have to work and play well together. From number five, which is, has to do with orchestration. Number four, which is the idea of constantly doing user behavior analytics. The idea being, it's not so much signature based like what snort can be or whatever in terms of listening in. It's more like, I know what bad behavior looks like. I, I can't tell you quite exactly what it is, but I know what it looks like. That's very important. Well, there's another two elements here involved when it comes to security and a, a zero trust, and that's policy change and also visualizing, and contextualizing things. Because when it comes to zero trust, I liken it to a zombie movie. Uh, it's Halloween, so we can talk about zombies, right? Um, what's your favorite zombie movie? If you could type it into the chat window, that'd be great. What is your favorite zombie movie? Uh, there's 28 Days Later, or there's Night of the Living Dead, or 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 what have you, World War Z, or uh, what's that, What uh, Walking Dead, right? Well, there are all sorts of truisms depending on the movie. Oh, Shaun of the Dead, good for you, Greg. I love that. It's so funny. Um, but if whether you don't like movies, uh, zombie movies or not, some movies, they're incredibly fast, or they're slow, but they're going to get you. That's what I mean by inexorable. There's the idea that infection can happen rapidly. It can happen to anyone. Hackers or zombies move uh, together or work uh, separately. What's, what I'm saying is there's an analogy here between hackers and zombies, as it were, okay? And uh, one of the real truisms is the idea that a friendly member of the team can turn against you almost at any time. Right. So there is no good to go when it comes to zombie movies because your best friend can suddenly become a zombie and turn on you. Although the same thing happens with our devices and our processes. What was once a trusted process a microsecond ago is now out to get you. Um, there's always that idea that in zombie movies, they always try to go and find a perimeter, don't they? Right. A perimeter will help us. Well, actually, that's not the case. Uh, perimeter usually doesn't help you. Right. Because so with zero trust, you're constantly monitoring, you're constantly visualizing, and you're automating things because we don't have enough workers uh, to do this, and, and they could never act fast enough. But we do need workers that understand how all that works. So, uh, so it's very important that we do segmentation, micro-segmentation, et cetera. And you treat the network itself as the enemy. In other words, there's zero trust. We trust nothing. And that's kind of interesting. 
was talking to a guy named Han Seng Bay, who I'm going to be working with him in, uh, in, uh, at a, an event in Hawaii here in about uh, two weeks, three weeks. He's basically saying, if you're thinking in terms of direction of travel, you're not doing zero trust. And if it can be contacted, it can be hacked, right? So he can't trust anything. And when it comes to perimeters, I was talking to a lady named Mariana Pereira. She is a director at um, a company called Dark Trace that does a lot of end user monitoring. And she said, after all the things that have happened uh, uh, this year, having to do with COVID, et cetera, we finally killed off the idea of the perimeter. And you can't do next level security or networking unless you understand the, the fundamentals. One of the overrated ideas is the CIA triad, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. That's, let's talk about something that's underrated. And this is a, the idea of confidence, information, and aggregation. There's my new CIA triad, meaning it's very important to gather data, to collect, crunch, and contextualize data, to cut through the fog of more. That's a term that's a, a spoof on the idea of the fog of war. Whenever a battle is fought, there's always confusion in the battle. That's often called the fog of war. Well, the fog of more in security is a very real thing because we need to find that hidden hacker and discover pivots and cut through uncertainty. This is why we use cybersecurity threat intelligence. This is why we do have security operations centers to get actionable information. I was recently talking to a group, uh, he's now the vice chancellor, uh, uh, group captain Amoran Chaman Choi. He basically said zero trust is only one matter, but zero trust is a part of analytics. And so I started working with him and his team online. That's me uh, in San Francisco in a hotel room, communicating with them via Zoom. And then this is, I got to meet him just a couple of weeks, three weeks ago, uh, face to face. And we were doing a bunch of work with security analytics. So cybersecurity threat intelligence is another very important uh, concept. So is identity access management. And this is the idea of basically uh, helping organizations determine the proper access. To when it comes to another skill, governance, risk management, and compliance, GRC. See, there's the, uh, when I ask people about security, and I said, uh, you know, it doesn't mean what people think it means, like uh, the Prince's Bride, uh, somebody did mention privacy as a concept of security. They're two very related things. You cannot get your security going unless you have your, uh, you can't get privacy going unless you get your security ducks in a row first. That's one reason why, and this is the OSIRM. We all know what the OSIRM looks like. There's the for, there's seven layers. And uh, somewhat ironically, there is the idea of additional layers that you can think of here, okay, uh, when it comes to security. I think another thing that's overrated that happens uh, when people hire get onto the get into the job market, they realize that there are all these companies out there that are asking for way too much experience uh, for the for a particular job role. Now, look at it from the employer's perspective. When they're hiring somebody, they want to take risk uh, steps to reduce risk, and so they're looking for proof that you know what you're doing. Um, that's why they've traditionally looked for four-year degrees or some sort of pedigree, or they do these long multi -inter multiple interviews and things like that. That kind of drives me crazy. Um, I think it's more important to think in terms of skillability. You as a, an individual need to show that you can learn new things and that the skills you've learned, that you can basically use them uh, in a negotiated sort of way. And that's a fancy way of saying, I've got technical skills. Now I need to learn how your business works so I can help. So when it comes to hiring security workers, this is a group of uh, potential students. I was able to re-meet several of these students. Uh, that picture was taken about four or five years ago. I was able to meet many of these uh, students who are now security workers. And what they did is they got jobs as security analysts. And we're doing work at CompTIA to help organizations ask the right questions of the workforce so that if you're a security analyst, they won't over-spec and say, well, you got to have a four-year degree and tens of, you know, 10 years of experience before we even talk to you. Um, we're working with them to basically see the value of workers as they come to them uh, and the value of the education that they have already, that they've received. An underrated concept here, folks, is the ability to avoid self-canceling thoughts. By self-canceling, I think too many people think, hey, this security stuff sounds too complex. I'm not good enough for it. Don't cancel yourself, right? Don't let anybody cancel you, especially yourself. 
Uh, this is a picture of my dog. His name is Kuma. Uh, he is the most enthusiastic and kind and and very uh, 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 spazzy little dog, right? But he has tons of confidence about himself, right? Develop that in yourself. So avoid self-canceling thoughts, right? Make them inconceivable, right? Um, you don't necessarily need a four-year degree to get started. Or you, you, if you're getting into security at the age of 25 or 35 or whatever, that's not too late. You don't have to start at five. You don't have to be a, be a math and calculus expert. Uh, you need to be, you don't need to be an expert programmer first. You don't even need to become an expert programmer to be a good security person, right? Depending on the job role. Your life experience is always relevant. I've seen people, uh, for example, I recently talked to somebody in Jamaica who was basically a, like an Uber driver and is now a security analyst. Well, one of the best things that she was able to do was basically realized that as a security analyst, that ability to make a, a, a quick human connection with people, right, and provide a service, well, that's what Uber does. That's what an Uber driver does. And she was able to take that skill, combine it with some technical knowledge, and now she's a security analyst. Pretty cool. And she's really old, too. I think she's like 19, right? So it's really cool to see somebody uh, make that transition quickly. A lot of people don't know how to get started. Well, we can help you with that. All right. I think it's important for you to find your security identity. If you know The Prince's Bride, that movie, right? You know, I am Diego Montoya, right? You killed my father, prepare to die or whatever that was, right? Think of it yourself, right? How would you introduce yourself? Hi, I am a security worker, prepare to be secured, right? Are you going to become a compliance specialist, right? Somebody who's less technical, but very important, right? Are you going to become a cloud security administrator? Is working in the cloud really something that you consider cool? right? Well, great. Do you want to become a security analyst or a pen tester or combine those to become a, pen, a threat hunter, some sort of team leader? You know, how do you want to identify yourself? And I think it's really important that you brand yourself that way. So what's the pathway? And let's see, that's a picture I took fairly recently while I was in New Zealand on CompTIA Business. I was at a trade show there. If you remember that, that uh, scene in uh, Lord of the Rings, the first one, right? Uh, what is that? Uh, anyway, a fellowship of the ring where they're hiding underneath the, the root of that tree and the Nazgul are searching for them. Remember that? That's where that was filmed. That's what that picture was. Well, anyway, your pathway, right? What can it look like, right? In this case, uh, there's a picture of me uh, walking up a mountain called Helvellyn in the UK. And it was quite the journey, right? In fact, there are people who died on that mountain, which, which uh, members of my family pointed out, uh, but I ignored them and I climbed it anyway. I went up with happened to be there with several people. I'd never knew them before. And this is us walking up there. It's about a 300 foot fall on one side. And I think three or four or 500 foot on the other. Some people, <laughs> you can see they ran back, right? Um, I made it to the top, right? Uh, probably shouldn't have gone, but I did it. What does this have to do with uh, security? Well, you can go on a journey that might seem a bit scary, right? That I don't know, it seems uncertain. Maybe other people are having a hard time. There's a journey here. New Horizons can help you with that, okay? You can get into security in various different ways. You can be a cybersecurity analyst or a consultant or a VAPT person, whatever. But it's up to you to make that decision. CompTIA certainly can help you with that. You know, where do you start? Well, do you know how endpoints work? That's what A plus teaches. Do you know all the network protocols, how, how endpoints talk to each other? That's network plus. So there's security plus that starts out the entire cybersecurity pathway. We have a data track. There are various elements that, that you can use. Now, there's some CompTIA research here that I think is very important for you to take a look at. The reason is, is because you can see the trends that are going on. You can take a look at our, uh, let's see, it came out this summer, the State of Cybersecurity 2022. If you really want to go do some deep, deep research, take a look at the 21 report and the 20 report, and you can identify some trends. It's kind of cool. Just recently, a couple of weeks ago, three weeks ago, we released the Workforce and Learning Trends report that basically talks about the importance of how organizations are reskilling people. There's the IT Industry Outlook 2022 that came out. Let me think here. That came out two or three months ago. The cybersecurity report just came out here about, what, two weeks ago. Very new. So these are things that you can take a look at, resources that you can look at to learn more about what you can do to become a security worker, right? Uh, and what you can do to make sure you get the right skills. So thank you very much for your time. I'm sorry about the glitch. 
earlier and also for this allergy that I seem to have picked up or whatever. Um, but uh, if anybody has any questions, I'm uh, willing to answer any questions online or uh, elsewhere. Uh, if you want, uh, uh, again, uh, you can join with me on LinkedIn. You can ask me questions via email. Uh, if you look at your chat window, uh, there is the URL uh, for the uh, to download these slides. Or if you want to be fancy, you can use this QR code here, which should work. Hold your phone up to it, right? Grab the QR code and you can download these slides directly.